All right, so it's seven two. And you are all welcome to the lawyer's diary. Today's edition is going to be an interesting one. I'll believe that we all mute our. Okay. Isaac, you can unmute your, your speakers. And then okay, sure. You can hear me, I guess. Yes, I can hear you now. So, um, you are welcome to today's edition of the Lawyer's Diary. Today's edition promises to be an interesting one because I'm here with one of my very good friends who happens to also be, I won't say an expert, but very good in family law related issues. He is Isaac Abrum Lati. He's a private legal practitioner and works with one of the best law firms in Ghana, Sam Kujetu and Associates. His area of practice includes uh, property law, commercial law, ADR, and estates and roles. He's currently a member of the African Regional Forum and also a liaison officer for Young Lawyers Committee of the International Bar Association. So he's an international lawyer. Isaac, welcome to today's edition of the Lawyer's Diary. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm very, I must say that I'm very humbled to be on this platform. Like you rightly indicated, I am not an expert. I don't want to be considered as an expert. But I think that this is a learning um, process. So we are just going to share knowledge and uh, discuss the law as far as we're concerned. Very well. So today's discussion basically is about uh, wills. Many a times we've seen people expressing the interest of making wills, but either they fail to follow the normal procedures or the lay down procedures in making a will. To them, they may think they have a will, but upon their death, we realize that what they did in according or in accordance with the statutory provisions of making a will does not qualify as a valid role. There have been instances where people have even made a role, but upon their death, such roles cannot be discovered. Later, properties are shared about 10, 15, 20 years later. Then uh, through searches, the role is found. How has the law treated such instances? We also look at if I make a role and I want to change it, how do I do it? And then if I've made a wall and also decided that I don't want to um, hold on to the wall again, I want to cancel the wall, how do we do it? So these are many other things that we'll be discussing today at the lawyer's diary. So Isaac, um, let's just get start. When we say a wall, legally, what is a wall? If All somebody right. comes to you and asks you that what is a wall, what is the explanation? Well, well, I'll simply say that um, legally, a will is a declaration of intention in a prescribed form um, by a person on matters that he wants to happen upon his death. And I choose this um, description carefully because people always have the impression that wills only deal with the distribution of property. But it is not so because, like I've indicated, it relates to matters that it's a state that wants to happen as far as his, 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 his intentions are concerned upon his death. So it's- Because, because of, our, of our audience, uh, yeah. we also prefer that we use simple languages. When you right, say testator, okay. who is a testator? A testator is essentially a person making a will. A person who is making a will. Okay. Exactly. So- Traditionally, there have been uh, certain definitions of goals. You know, in- um, before the coming into force of say the was Act, yeah. people call role a deathbed declaration where a person is dying and calls off his people. Does that definition still stand or there have been some modifications? All right, so definition? in Ghana, there are two forms of a will. There's the customary law will and there's a statutory law will. So the customary law will is the one that I believe you are referring to, which is popularly known as uh, Saman so, which is an Akan um, word. But I think that there's an equivalent in other languages. So the customary law will is essentially an oral will because you know customary law 
close no writing. So like you indicated in the olden days, when people wanted to dispose of their properties upon their death, they made this form of a um, will. And with that one, like I said, it says oral, you just have to make it in the presence of two or more witnesses, credible witnesses who are disinterested in your will. And it has to be in respect of your self-acquired property. Because in customary law, you cannot dispose of family property, as it were, or property that does not belong to you. So you are right. Customary law will is still recognized under our laws. As a so does that mean that if an old man is dying and then calls, not even an old man, if any person is dying and calls of maybe in a hospital and calls of two or three people, like the nurse and then a the family member, and make certain proclamations, can that be considered as a will? Yes, the, the, the most important thing is that at the point of making those proclamations, he should have had the intention of making those proclamations to be his testament or to be his will. He must have known that this is a statement I'm making as far as um, the distribution of my property or for my death is concerned. Yes, so he can do so. Okay, so um, if, I, if I understand you all, uh, the word therefore is a declaration of intention of how Thank you me. want your properties to be shared yeah. upon death. Are there any conditions to making such world in terms of age, in terms of mental capacity? What are, what are some of the things that needs to be there before we can say that this world is indeed a valid world? Okay, so I think I have a um, thought on the customary law wills, because I initially said that a will is a declaration of intentions in a prescribed form. So with customary law wills, the person must be of a sound mind, you know, and has to be a self acquired property. Now, when you come to statutory wills, under the Wills Act, you must be of the age 18 or above. You must be of a sound mind and the property that you are seeking to dispose should also be your self-acquired property. Now, when we talk about soundness of mind, it should be at the time of executing the will, because you know there are people who, even though they are on sound mind, there are times when they have lucid periods. So at the point of execution of the will, if you have a sound mind, you can actually make a will. And again, soundness of mind means that you should be able to know the nature an effect of the thing that you are doing. You should know that what I'm doing is actually a will. So these are what we term as essential requirements for making a will. Okay, so when you say sound mind, it therefore also brings this question to bear that if I am under fear of say uh, being traumatized or being um, being put in certain situation by people if I don't give them my property in terms of saying right. rest or anything. Right. Can okay. you explain that portion to us very well? Then again, apart from being of a sound mind, of course, the will should also be made voluntarily. So if a will is made under duress, for example, your son one day comes to your room, points a gun at you and says that, dad, if you don't make your will and give me your house, I'm going to shoot you. And based on that threat, your father then decides to execute a will. That wouldn't have been voluntary because the will was made under duress. Or if um, the will was procured by means of fraud, for example, um, you know, you were promised maybe a thing in exchange of you making a will, and it turns out that the promise wasn't true at the time of making the will. That one also was procured by fraud, and so the will would not be valid. So if the will is procured under duress, if, it's, if it is procured under fraud or any undue influence, that also would make it invalid. The portion about undue influence, I need a bit of clarification because let me give you a typical example. A man is sick. He has so many children. Now, one of them particularly leaves her job, stays with the man, and then performs any or any forms or any form of um, thing to ensure that the man is of good health. And if the man should 
give all his properties to that person? Would that be undue influence? Well, I, I can understand uh, your sentiment. Would we say, would we say that because had it not been for the benevolent act, had it not been for the extra care that this lady gave to the man, he wouldn't have given the property to her. Would that be deemed as undue influence? So I appreciate your sentiment, and I must say that it is very difficult for somebody to say that a will was procured under undue influence because typically people make wills for people they love. You understand, wills are made typically out of natural affection for people. So um, that is also a very gray area. So once the will is validly executed, if you say that the will was procured under undue influence, you would have the responsibility or the burden of proving to the court you know, that the will was made under undue influence. Okay, so anything that you do to affect the, the testator's mind, and doesn't allow the testator to freely give out really, the property. Really exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's that's also kind of a very it's very difficult. Yeah, like it's I said, it's very difficult to to prove that. I mean, the will was made under undue influence. But you know, in court, the burden is always on the person who is alleging. So you would have to show to the court that um, this will is invalid because it was procured under undue influence. That would be for the court to determine. Because in contract law, there are certain kind of relationships that naturally are deemed to, you know, create a situation of undue influence. For example, um, a lawyer-client relationship or mm -hmm. um, depending on the circumstances. So it would be a question of fact for you to demonstrate to the court that this will was procured and down you. You mentioned something interesting that a client, a lawyer-client relationship, yeah. a client roll part of his properties to the lawyer as legal fees. <laughs> as legal fees? <laughs> yes. Well, um, I don't think that you can will part of your property to your, 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 your lawyer as legal fees. Like I indicated, that will create some form of um, undue influence. That, that, that may be a classic situation of you being unduly influenced to execute a will, you know. Okay, so you, you, you further mentioned that in terms of um, properties, it's only properties which you personally acquire or have been yeah. gifted to you yes. that you can um, devolve into an estate or you can give out in your world. Yes, yes. If I'm, a married, yeah, if I'm a married woman or a married man, can my husband Ooh. or my wife give our spousal property in terms of properties that we acquired independence of a marriage to any other person? That's also an interesting question. I, I recall that um, the issue of spousal property was discussed on this platform some time ago. Yes. Um, under our constitution, every spouse is entitled to a reasonable provision of um, the, the spouse's property. And the, the Supreme Court has over the years described spousal properties as property that is acquired during the pendency of marriage. Now, because your other spouse has an interest in that property, you cannot entirely dispose of that spousal property to another person without recourse to the interest of your wife. So at best, I would say that you can only dispose of your interest in the spousal property and not the entire spousal property. Mm. Yes. Okay. Okay, but I mean, that, that has been discussed here. Um, the, the definition as to what constitutes your interest yeah. in that property. So that if it's a three bedroom, would I say that I'm disposing of or giving to or to some other person rather than my wife? Or that well, would be see, it would be, it would be yeah. again, you know, spousal property is often, first of all, let me say that parliament has a duty to, you know, enact a law on the spousal, the property rights of spouses. In the absence of that particular law, the determination of the respective interests of spouses in spousal property is often made by the court. You know, it's often made by the court either upon the dissolution of a marriage or under such circumstances. So at best, I would say that you can only make reference to your interest in the property. It will then be for the court to determine the, the extent of your stake in that property, because that would be a matter of 
fact which the court will have to determine based on the contributions to some extent because you know we we have moved from the level of equality is equity to now going further to show some form of contribution. So it will be a matter of fact for the court to determine. And you cannot sit there and say that, okay, this is my 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 interest in my uh, property with you required during dependency of marriage. All right, all right. If you just joined us, we, we are discussing uh, making of a valid ball in Ghana and also making reasonable provisions for dependents. And our lawyer today is lawyer Isaac Lati. Uh, so far, we've explained to us what a world is. He has also explained the types of world that we have in Ghana and then the kind of properties that you can um, give to any person in your world. So now, lawyer, we are in the second phase of our discussion. That's right. If I want to make a world, what are the steps that I need to take? Okay, so um, I'm answering this question with something that you want to make a statutory will, because I guess we've described what a customary law will is. Exactly, exactly. If you want to make a statutory will, first of all, the will itself must be in writing. But before, before even saying this, I, I, I guess um, my statement may not be popular among lawyers. Individuals can make wills themselves, you know, but there are certain requirements in law that you must comply with which will make it advisable for you to seek the services of a lawyer in making the will. But when you take the responsibility of making the will yourself, then these are the requirements that you must satisfy under our will site. Firstly, the will must be in writing. And the will must be signed by the testator or at any other person upon his direction. If it has been signed by any other person at the direction of the testator, then there must be the presence of two witnesses at the same time in the presence of the testator, seeing to it that the other person who was instructed to sign the will has actually signed the will. Then in respect of the signature, the signature has to come at the tail end of the will, you know, because after the signature is made, any disposition coming after the signature will be invalid. So hmm. one of the cases, um, somebody- it, it means it won't, it won't be effective. Or it it won't wouldn't be effective. effective. It wouldn't be effective, exactly. So I think one of the cases, um, somebody made a will. And you know, the will was a four page document. So he made some dispositions on the first page and signed the bottom end of the first page. And you know, typically when you have a four page document, you staple it together. Unfortunately, the testator did not sign the end of the last page. So only the first page was admitted to prove it and all the other pages were ineffective. And that is why the signature of the testator has to be at the bottom of all the dispositions that are made. This is then again, I mean, yes. let's, 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 let's exhaust that page. So you, you right. mean to say that if I am executing my will, That's right. And it's a 10 page document. Yes. And then I sign in the first page. It means that the remaining nine pages will not The remaining nine before. pages will not be effective. Because you see, the signature is to give effect to all the things that are preceding the signature, is to attest to the, 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 the content of the will. And so, so far as the remaining pages are not adequately attested in terms of the last page to give effect of all the preceding pages they would be invalid and they would not be admitted to prove it. And that is why you must make sure that your signature comes at the end of all the dispositions that have been made. So at the end of the will, which will be the last page of your will. Okay, let's also uh, come back to the signature thing that signature, you said. Right. I mean, not all people are educated to, and even some educated people don't like to sign. signing of um, documents. Right. Okay. Okay. Will the law recognize marks in terms of uh, or Right. So under, 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 under our laws, under our interpretation act, a signature is defined to include a thumbprint and a mark. Okay. And in actual fact, I must say that sometimes the testator may not even be in the capacity to actually sign maybe due to a certain difficulty, due to a certain um, infirmity of the hand, he may not be in the position to sign. If there's evidence that his hands was aided to sign, 
that would also be valid. So you, under our laws, a signature includes a thumbprint and um, it includes a mark. And again, let me say that you talk, you've talked about um, illiterate. So I, I guess I need to chip this in. If the will was made by an illiterate or a blind man, there also has to be um, a declaration in the will stating that the will was read over and explained to him and he seemed to understand the content of the document before he places signature or before he places mark on the will. And I guess um, this is fairly straightforward because these are people who are disadvantaged in some way. So this is one of the safeguards that the law used to protect them and ensure that whatever documents that they have signed actually reflects their intention. Yes. Okay. So after the signature, no, before the signature, after the signature, we also mentioned that there need to be witnesses. Yes. The two people present at the same time. Yes. In an instance where um, I don't get all the two, one is there while I'm signing, and after signing, another person joins, what that will be deemed as um, ineffective. Let me explain. Um, and what, what, what at all is the role of the witnesses because um, exactly. the world is supposed to be my personal thing and they don't need to see what I'm writing. Exactly. Why, why do I need so the witnesses don't witness to the content of the will. What they witness is the due execution of the will. So when you make a will, it has to be your, your, your execution of the will has to be witnessed by two or more witnesses who are present at the same time. That is in respect of the acknowledgement of your signature. So the testator would either sign in their presence or acknowledge his signature in their presence. As far as that is concerned, both of them has to be present at the same time before he signs. The two witnesses should be present in the presence of the testator. They get the opportunity to see his signature or to see, I mean, him acknowledging his signature to them. However, when, when the witnesses when say, are when signing, however, when the witnesses are signing the will as witnesses, they don't have to be present at the same time. The requirement is that they have to be present and sign before the testator, one after the other. It can be both at the same time, they can sign one after the other. So that's the difference. When they are, when they are actually signing the will, they can sign independent of each other, so, so long as they are in the presence of the testator. But when the testator is acknowledging a signature to them, both of them have to be present at the same time. Okay, so when the testator, the person making the will is signing off the signature, there have to be two witnesses present at present all time. Present at, at the same time, yes. When he is at signing. At the same time. Him, yes. So Not just if, signing. He can either sign the signature or acknowledge it to them. them. They have signed it and he just shows them that, look, this is my signature. So either signing or acknowledgement. acknowledgement there yeah. have to be yeah. two people present at, the same present, present at the same time. All right. Okay. This was, you, can, you can imagine how complicated this process is. So if you take upon yourself the responsibility of making your will, you may falter. No, we are, we are also we are also to encourage people to understand right, okay. how it is done. Uh, so, <laughs> in terms of uh, summary, uh, the wall needs to be signed. Yes. Either thumbprinted by mark or yes. by signature. Yes. You it need has to be. two witnesses to be present at the same time, and their main purpose is to just to see you sign. Sign it exactly. Okay. Okay. And, and it has to be right. Has to be right. Has to be right. After that one next. So after that, the will is uh, deposited in the court. It is not a legal requirement. You can deposit it in the high court where you have a fixed place of abode for safekeeping. I would say that even though it is not a legal requirement, it is advisable because upon your demise. Because the courts give you an um, uh, give you a receipt. Upon your death, the demise is in English. <laughs> so is, I think demise is a... <laughs> okay. Anyway, upon your death, upon your death, um, that is the when the when, when the courts give you the receipt for the lodgement of the will or for the safekeeping of the will, it is that receipt that the executors or any beneficiaries will use in tracing the will. Because many a times when people don't deposit their wills in the court's registry, the problem is that the person may have died, the family members wouldn't know that he left a will, 
And even if he left a will and it was kept in the custody of a lawyer, there are instances where you have solo practitioners. I mean, a one-man practice where the lawyer may have died a long time ago, so it's very difficult to even know whether you know, the, 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 the deceased actually made a will. So it is prudent that you deposit the will in the registry of the court, at least for that one, your family members or your beneficiaries or the executors can go to the court registry and conduct a search to determine whether you actually left a will. Before the deposition, I know that whilst making the will, uh, sometimes you include certain persons to undertake certain actions upon your debt, pay off all your just debt, pay off any uh, liabilities that you may have. Can you throw more light on them? Uh, I know they are called executors. I think so uh, what, I, is I, I, what is their role? Why and who can who can who do I choose to act as an executor? Right. Um, right. Executors are the people who have the responsibility of ensuring the compliance with the will. As the name presupposes, executors, they execute the will, or they have the responsibility of seeing to the execution, using a literal sense, ensuring that the will is enforced. So before you appoint an executor, an executor, the person must be 20, 80, uh, 21 years old and above, and he must have the ability to contract. So that means that he could also be of a sound mind. And yes, that's about it. But I would want to say that there's the need for you to at least give some form of prior notice to the people you intend to be your executors, even though it is not a legal requirement, because you know it is a burdensome tax of administering an estate. They are the ones who are going to administer the estate, and some people may not want to be caught between family problems and misunderstandings here and there. So at least when you explain to the people that you, look, I want to appoint you as an executor, then you, you, are, you are guaranteed that they are actually going to undertake that responsibility upon your demise. Because if they don't admit their will to probate um, upon certain instances, you know, by certain beneficiaries, their right to executorship can be extinguished. So you don't want somebody to renounce probate when you are dead. So you want to ensure that you've made the person aware that you've appointed him as an executor. Well, they are what, the ones what is their role? What is their role? If, they, pay, uh, say, um, they, pay, they pay your just debt. You know, they, are, they are more like your personal representatives. They are the ones who will represent the estate upon your demise. So they are going to pay all your debts. If anybody wants to sue the person who is dead or the estate, let's say you were owing somebody, any person who wants to sue you would sue the executors of your estate to ensure that whatever is due them is paid to them. When their will is admitted to probate, they are the ones who would ensure that they divest the interest in, 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 the, in the form of creating the necessary instruments under our will to transfer ownership from them as it is to the beneficiaries. So they are the personal representatives of the estate. If you want anything to do with the estate, you meet the executors. OK, OK. Thank you very much for such uh, clarity and then the explanation given. The next line of action is that I've deposited the wall at the registry. Now the person who made the wall is dead. One, how do we make, how do we, um, no, or how, how, how will we be made aware that a person made a will? Because I know that wills are treated as a secret document in Ghana. So that even for the old man, or the share, I mean, what will be high sets in the, 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 the secret place that nobody else should know. What are the steps to take? How would we know that a will have been made? And what are the steps that any person needs to take after death? Okay. To even really confirm and ensure that the wall has been made before. Right. So, so when um, a person makes a will, and like I indicated, he has the opportunity of depositing it at the registry of the court. Once it is deposited, the family members of the deceased person can conduct a search in the registry of the court to find out whether he actually left a will. 
if the family members also know that during the lifetime of the testator, he had a lawyer or he had a legal, you know, a person who was handling his matters, they can also go and see the lawyer and find out whether he left a will with, 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 with a lawyer. And of course, when you deposit your will in the uh, registry of the court, you are also given a copy. So they can look through the safe of um, the deceased person to find out whether he left a will. But the most guaranteed way of finding out whether a person left a will is to conduct a search in the registry of the court. So if you think that the person may have deposited the will, you write a letter to the registry of the court indicating the person's name and if you were privy to the receipts that he was given, you also indicate the receipt number. And based on that information, they will trace the will for you. After that is done, you would have to read the will. So a will can be read you know, with the assistance of the registry of the court. You write a letter to the registry. You indicate to them that um, you have discovered the will of the deceased person, and you want the will to be read. In the letter, you have to indicate the number of people or the pe persons who will be present at the reading of the will. And once that is written, the registry will reply the letter, fixing the date for the will to be read. So that is the immediate step that is taken upon the demise of the testator. Okay, that's interesting. And um, I, I want to find out that if a testator or a person making a will make some provision for children below the age of 18, what are the steps that needs to be taken and then how, how, is, how will that be treated? Children below the age of 18. Age of 18. If I have school going, children of school going age, yes. and I devise or want a property to them, how will that be treated? Can the children just take, or will the teachers give it to the children? So the executors will hold the um, property in trust of the children until they are um, of the age of contracting. Because you see, the executors have to create an instrument known as a vesting ascent for the children. And that is more like a, what we lawyers term as a conveyance. And before you can be a party to such an instrument, you need to have a contractual capacity. You should be of the age of 18. So until the children have attained the age of 18, I believe the exec I, I am of the opinion that the executors will be holding the property in trust for them. Okay, so it means that um, you can roll your property to your kids. Oh yes. But they can only take control of that property control of it. when they exactly. become of um, a mature age. Yes. Okay. Um, let, let me take you back. You said that they need to the executors needs to make certain applications to the court. How is that um, process? Um, how, how, do they, how do they carry on with that process? And then after that, what are the things? Because I know that sometimes there are some um, estate duties that you need to pay, what percentage needs to be paid. And, uh, and... OK, so after the will is read, the will has to be proved in court. Because, I mean, the fact that a will has been discovered does not automatically mean that that will be admitted as the will of the deceased person. At that point in time, it's just to say that we have seen a will or an instrument purporting to be a will or an instrument we think is a will. So the people named as executors in the will would have to apply for what we call probate. Now probate is the process by which we prove the will in court so that the court admits the will as indeed the last um, testament of the deceased person. They must make an application for probate. And in, in making an application for probate, there is a list of people who are considered as uh, uh, people who have the priorities for making the application for probate. Firstly, is the executors. And secondly, is the beneficiaries. And thirdly, is uh, any other person who does not have an interest in the will, was not a beneficiary in the will, but would have benefited from the will if the deceased had died without leaving a will. That is where PNDC law 111 comes in. So people who have an interest in the estate of the deceased person, if he had died interested without leaving a will, these are the 
list of people in order of preference or in order of priority who can make an application for probate. So in making the application for probate, usually when there is no dispute about the validity of the will, when there's no contention amongst the family members as to the legitimacy of the will, whether the will was indeed actually the last will of the deceased person, all that the testators have to do is to make an application before the court, attach to the application the last will of the deceased person, um, attach documents showing that indeed the person is dead, which is the death certificate or burial permit, and an inventory of the properties that the person had. Then they swear to an affidavit showing that indeed the will was validly executed. And the court upon such an application will satisfy itself by inspecting the documents to see that indeed the will is valid. Once all these are complied with, I mean, the will will be admitted to probate. Now I must emphasize that before probate is taken, you cannot deal with the estate of a deceased person. And I think I have to really emphasize this very well, particularly in a Ghanaian society where head of families think they have some sort of powers to, you know, show when people die. Unless and until probate is taken, you cannot deal with the estate of a deceased person. You cannot, as it were, start using the property, you know, I mean, if it is a property that is a rented property, you as a family head cannot go into the property and start collecting rent and dissipating it in any manner that you want. If you do that, you commit a criminal offense known as intermeddling, Mm. And you will be liable to a conviction of not more than two years imprisonment. Or you can also be fined 500 penalty units. In Ghana, I think a penalty unit is 12 Ghana C. Yeah, so 500 penalty units, um, if my mathematics is, is, is I know, strong, it will be, so. be about 6,000 Ghana. No, lawyers don't. don't, <laughs> lawyers, don't. <laughs> lawyers are not good mathematicians yeah, unless they come to the, yeah, but, legal piece. Exactly, but I think it's about 6,000 Ghana CDs. So you can find okay. both 6,000 Ghana CDs and sentenced to imprisonment for not more than two years. So it's very, very important. And even with the ex executors, of course, the, the law says that executors, that the role of executors commence upon the demise of the person. They can do certain acts that are incidental to um, their role as executors, like paid funeral debts and all that. They're just debts of the deceased person. But once executors also take possession of the property of a deceased person, they also have three months within which they have to apply for probate to the court to prove their will. Otherwise, they would also be, you know, be subject to these stringent um, penalties, that is um, a fine of 500 penalty units, or subject to imprisonment for not more than two years. And in fact, under the Administration of Estate Act, if they don't go for probate within one month, which is quite interesting, within one month, they can also be cited for contempt of court. So that is something that we have to really take due notice of. Now, when the executors, you know, sometimes some executors begin to dispute whether the will is indeed the will of the deceased person. So they may be a bit hesitant to prove the will in court. Any beneficiary under the will, when he realizes that the executors are not proving the will, are not applying for probate, can give a notice or can file a notice in court. And the notice, once it is served on the executors, the executors will have 14 days within which they have to prove the will. Now, if they don't prove the will within 14 days, their rights to executorship will be extinguished. And under such circumstance, persons who, are, uh, who have the right to take letters of administration can apply for letters of administration with will and it. So that is also another point. If you have an executor who is hesitant to apply for COVID, you can file a, a notice on him. You can file a notice in court which will be served on him and he will be duty bound to prove the will within 14 days. Now, We've talked about situations where there's no contention about the will. And uh, no, let's, let's finish up with the contention. Um, right, okay. If I want to contest the will, what should be the grounds under which a will can be contested? 
Well, several grounds. I mean, we've talked about this, the, the, the circumstances under which you can say a will is valid. So you can contest the will on the grounds that the deceased person did not have the mental capacity or was not of a sound mind at the time that he executed the will. Maybe you knew him to be insane, so to speak, and or he was suffering from some mental illness mental that at the time of executing the will, he could not have appreciated the content of the will. Again, okay. you can contest the will if the person is not 18 years of age, because clearly the law says that you can only make a will when you are 18 years of age. You can contest the will if the will was procured under fraud or by duress, like we have already explained. You can contest the will if you believe that it was not the executor who signed it, it was not the testator, or it was not the deceased person who signed the will, or the will does not bear the signature of, 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 of the deceased person. So these are the various ways. Again, if the will did not comply with the formal validities, like I've indicated, if there wasn't any witness you know, who signed as a witness to the will, if the testing witnesses were not present at the same time when the testator, these are all the circumstances under which you can contest the will. But normally people contest the will because they say that the will is a forgery or it is not the will of the deceased person. So that is also a ground. If you think or if you have the view that the will must have been forged by people, and you know, in this day and age, people do all manner of things. People, I, I, I am told that people can even go to the extent of going to the mortuary and then um, doing a will and have the dead body tampering to the will. So <laughs> these are all, all, all the circumstances under which you can contest a will. Yes. And okay, okay. I'm sure you would want to know the procedure for contesting the will. Yes, yes. Continue with that. The the executors themselves, if they are of the view that looking at this, it could not have been the testator who made the will, they can um, issue a writ in court seeking the court to make a determination on the validity of the will. So the executors themselves, when in their view, they, 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 they think that this will <laughs> must not have been made by the testator, they themselves can issue a writ. And then any person claiming under the estate of the deceased person. You know, there are some people who may not have been mentioned in the will, and they stand to benefit if the person did, did not die living in the will. They stand to benefit under the interstate succession law. For example, if you are a wife, and you're, or I, I wouldn't say a wife, but if you are, let's say, a child or even a wife, and you think that your husband did not, you know, do you a great service or he did not, it couldn't have been his will. You can contest the will, of course, on legitimate grounds, but the process in doing so is that you can also serve a notice on the executors for them to prove their will in court in what we call solemn form. That is by initiating an action in court and then adding the people who are beneficiaries as defendants to the suit. Or um, you can just initiate an action in court as a beneficiary, as a person who is a beneficiary to the estate of the deceased person, to prove that to have the will determined as to his validity without necessarily serving a notice on the executors. Hmm. The mention of children in your submissions <clears throat> brings this question to bear. Yeah. Do I have any duty to leave some estate for my kids, regardless of their ages? So that if I build my properties, I've looked after my children, is there an obligation that I still have to give something to my children? Well, I think in answering this question, I should start off by saying that ordinarily, a testator has the right to be as capricious as he can in his will. A testator has the right to be as wicked as he can in his will, not to leave anything to anybody under normal circumstances. Because you know, there's something known as testamentary freedom and you are at liberty to divest of your interest in your properties in any way and in any manner that you want. Nobody can begrudge you. But in Ghana, it appears that there are certain limitations on the testamentary freedom of people. 
So much as you can divest of your interest in your property in any manner that you want, there's now a provision in our laws under the Wills Act where if people who are deemed as dependents, I mean, people who, and dependents under the law is qualified as uh, children, uh, your spouse, or your parents, if they can show to the court that in your lifetime, you did not give them anything or you, you did not make any provision for them, they were dependent on you. And as a result of the fact that you did not leave them anything in your will, they are going to suffer some hardship. Then they are given the right to bring an application to the court to obtain what we call a reasonable provision out of the estate of the deceased person. So, like I said, at a, at, a, at a starting point, you can decide what to do with your will. But there are certain people that if you do not make adequate provision for during your lifetime, and you also did not make any provision for in your will, they have the right to bring an application for some reasonable provision if they satisfy certain requirements under our laws. So, so I mean, you are making a very uh, debatable issues here. If yeah. I make provisions for you in my lifetime and I don't leave you anything, the law will not give that reasonable provision. Reasonable, exactly. The law will not give you yeah. that protection because, I mean, clearly, in the lifetime of the deceased person, he made some sort of provision for you. You understand? You must satisfy what is the provision? What is the provision? Do you mean that if I pay my case school fees and then I don't leave them anything? Will I be right to say that in my life that I'm making reasonable provision for them? Well, let me say that it is something which the court will consider all the surrounding circumstances because one of the last requirements is that looking at all the surrounding circumstances, the court should be satisfied that you know you are not entitled to any reasonable provision. So that can be an example. I mean, your school fees was paid. You are a child who is above 18 years of age and you are unable to show that you are likely to suffer any hardship, then of course, you, you wouldn't be clear with that protection. So it is, a, it, is, it, is a, it, is, it is a factual matter which the court determines to see all these surrounding circumstances. First of all, the children must be um, below the age of 18 years. So that if you are above the age of 18 years, you don't qualify at all. Don't qualify. You don't qualify in the first place to say that my father did not leave anything in my will. So I even am if you are 18 years and you are dependent on your father, the law doesn't take yes, the law, the laws, you see, at 18, it is deemed that you are of the age of maturity. You can't fend for yourself, unfortunately. No, but typically, typically in our traditional system or in our cultural system, especially where the kind of world where we come from. Naturally, even at age 25, you will still be dependent on your parents. Well, so I want to say that just 18 I, I, years. I think maybe this is something that maybe our lawmakers can consider. This is something that our lawmakers can consider because you are right. I mean, some of us when we were 20 years or when we were 22 years, we were still depending on our parents. But unfortunately, that is what we have in the law. And until the will Act is amended by parliament, that is the provision of the law. Because we can also look at another situation where even if you are above the age of 18 and you are suffering from any mental impairment or you know, you are the case of children with Down syndrome. I mean, clearly these are people who, even though they are 18 years of age, they still can be seen as dependents, you know, and there should be some form of provision to put uh, made for them. But when you look at the black letter of our law, such people will not, will not, will not qualify because they are more than 18 years of age. Mm. Okay. And then you also mentioned an aspect of uh, your parents also being deemed as dependent as well yes. as spouses. Yes. So if during your lifetime, you did not make any provision for them. And what then you also didn't make any... Is there an income bearing venture? So well, you see, a house. What, what the is, court, what is the court have said that the courts have said that this these things are done on a case-by-case -case basis, you understand? Mm -hmm. Because 
provision for some for, for me may be different for for you you understand provision for um Kwame Ahim, uh, in a village somewhere may be different from provision for somebody in cantonment so these are factual matters and in going for the application you would have to show your circumstances in your lifetime you know it's, it's a matter of fact that the court determines but at least we can start off by saying that we can start off by saying that, that certain basic necessities were not provided to you or that sort of thing i agree that provision is to be deemed on a case-to-case -case basis yeah but if i make provisions for my parents my children on a monthly or yearly basis that is also making them dependent on me Exactly. Uh -huh. So the fact that I make provision for them means that they are dependent on me. Okay, so okay, I can understand. I can understand where you are coming from. I can understand. Yes. I can understand where you are coming from. So then, of course, that would also go to show that they were dependent on you. They were dependent on you. They were so dependent it doesn't mean that. Um, I mean, we can take it from two sides. Two sides. Once exactly. you were given, you were not making any provision. Any for provision. You were not taking care of them, exactly. and you are dead. Exactly. So the exactly. law should make exactly. some provision exactly. for them. Exactly. Exactly. And then you are also making provisions for them. Provision for me, such that I've been so dependent on you, and that exactly. now you have not left anything in your will for me. Uh -huh. And I am, it doesn't just end there, and I am likely to suffer hardship because you did not make any provision for me. Because you exactly. see, if you are a wife, if you are a wife, and let's say, of course, your husband made provision for you in your lifetime, I mean, in his lifetime, and now you are not in a position to suffer any hardship because you are adequately employed, you are earning some huge sums of salary, you cannot be qualified for reasonable provision. So it just doesn't end at the fact that you were dependent, but that you were likely to suffer hardship too. All right, and we forgot something, but as a way final sacrifice in change, I've made a wall. I want to change the provisions of the world. I want to cancel the world that I've made. Because I've realized that the house I gave to my son, even now, she doesn't, he doesn't show me any respect. I want to change his name to another person. How do I do it? Okay, so if you want to change the dispositions in your will by altering them, you can do so, for example, like you said, you make the necessary cancellation and then you inscribe it by physically altering the will. But after doing so, you must execute that alteration that you made in the same way and manner as you execute a will. So you have to sign as a testator. You have to sign in the presence of two or more witnesses who are present at the same time or acknowledge your signature on the alteration to them. And they also have to sign as witnesses to that alteration. That is one way of altering your will. Secondly, you can re-execute the will altogether. So that would be by writing the date of its re-execution and signing it in the same way and manner that I have explained. Or you can execute what we call a codicil, which is like a supplement to the will, which can also stand as a will in itself. So you execute a codicil stating the necessary alterations that you have made. And because it is subsequent to the will which you have made, that alterations will take precedence. In, in, in the world, and that's how you, you make our trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been very explanatory. Let me ask. Let me ask the last question, and we we'll allow our fellow people to come in. So, um, if my father makes a war, yeah, he's no more. But as at the time he died, we couldn't find the war, and the properties have been shared to third parties. Right. And maybe 10, 15, 20 years later. Through any of my searches, I find, or I find out that my dad made a wall. How? What are the steps to take? Can I go back to all the people who have inherited or benefited from the property and start seizing it? Because I've seen and we've read the wall and realized that most of the properties were even um, gifted to me, mm -hmm. and I'm now of a full age. What should I do? So, first of all, let me say that if because the will was not discovered, letters of administration were taken in respect of the estate and based on the letters of administration, they have shared the properties of the deceased person. 
the executors to the will that has been discovered can make an application for the revocation of the letters of administration. Because our law says that letters of administration can be revoked for a good cause. I mean, if the letters of administration was procured by fraud or upon the discovery of a will, which I see it as a good cause because the court always will want to give effect to the testator's intention rather than the provisions under the interstate succession law. So once a will is discovered, the executors can make an application for revocation of the letters of administration. Now, the question that comes to the fore is that once the letters of administration has been revoked, the issue is that can the properties be traced in their same form? Now, if upon the taking of letters of administration, the people who benefited under the early have sold the properties to third parties, then third parties' rights would have accrued. So you cannot go to the third party who bought the property unknowingly from a beneficiary under an alien and say that you are coming to take back the property because there, there was a provision in a will made to you. And in fact, in our administration of estate act, it says that dispositions made to third parties are protected. However, when the beneficiaries still are enjoying the property, they have not divested their interest in, in third parties, then they would have a duty under law to return the properties to the executors. And in fact, the executors can initiate an action for recovery of possession because once a will is found upon the death of the testator, all the properties vest in the executors. They are the personal representatives, so they have the duty to take that step. If the executors fail to take that step of going for the revocation of the letters of administration, then any beneficiary under the will can also apply to the court for a revocation of the letters of administration and go through the whole process of trying to get back the property. But the caveat is that we, you should only hope that the properties will be in their state, as in being with the beneficiaries under the LA. If they have sold the properties to third parties, then unfortunately, that is your loss. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lati. We are extremely grateful. We will start reading some questions from our um, viewers. So, um, Idris Mbia asked that, who do you recommend make a war? And at what stage in a person's life should this consideration come to play? I'm sure she's asking this because you don't need to be an old person. So yes, you know, people always have the people always have the perception that when you are when you make a will, then it means you are going to die. But um, that is not the case. Wills can be revoked at any point in time. So anybody at all can make a will, so long as you are above the age of 18. And I think that as we are in this era of COVID-19, when a lot of things are uncertain, I think this should really tell us something that, you know, as human beings, we are mortal and we can die at any point in time. We all don't know the time that we will leave this stage called Earth. So anybody who is above the age of 18 can make a will. You know, you don't have to wait till you have acquired all the properties because if we all knew the time that we were going to die, then of course I would have said that anybody that knows that time is going to die is the one that, that has to make a will. But so long as we all don't know the time that we are going to die, then we, are, we, we all qualify to make a will if we are above the age of 18 years. Sure. And then another question from Sandra Mwachima, I think it's been answered. She wanted to find out after one is dead and the will is read by the lawyer, who is responsible for ensuring the adequate execution of the will? You've mentioned that it's the executors. Exactly. Under what circumstances can a will be contested? Uh, that has also been dealt with. And can a beneficiary transfer his part of the will to another person? Well, let me say that let, let, let me say that because a will only takes effect upon the death of the testator, beneficiaries don't have any interest in the property while the testator is alive. The interest of beneficiaries only accrue upon the death of the testator. And it doesn't even end there upon the adequate vesting in them by the executors through the creation of a vesting asset. So when she says, can I make can a beneficiary transfer his or her interest? I am only hoping that she means after 
a vesting asset has been adequately exactly. created for the beneficiary. Yes. If that is the case, of course, it becomes it's your actually, property, so you are liberty to deal with it. But if you know or you are aware that your father has made a will, at that point in time, so long as he's alive, you are not entitled to it. So you don't even have the capacity to transfer your interest in the world, so to speak. And then Enokakuwa is also asking that with respect to customer role, which is mostly common in Ghana, what happens if someone contests that the property is a family property? So it, it is the same procedure for contesting the will. If it is a customary will and the, they want to enforce the will, they will make an application for probate and depose to an affidavit showing the witnesses who were present when the statements were being made orally. So anybody who wants to contest that customary will has to go through the same process of contesting the will on the grounds that the property was not a self-acquired property of the deceased person. And in fact, under our customary law, it is quite clear that even if you build on family land, even if you, you go to your hometown and Onismos, you are a champion lawyer in Accra, so you've gotten <laughs> millions of dollars. <laughs> Onismos has gotten millions of dollars and he goes to his hometown to build. If he builds on family on property, land. it is not his property, so he cannot yes. even dispose of it in his will. Um, Christiana Franklin asked that if an estate is a joint project for a couple, does the widow have an entitlement in her spousal share of the property aside his? Do you understand can the you, question? Can you the question? I was, question I was looking that, at the question if you were right. Okay, so your question Sorry. is that if I have a joint property with my husband That's right. and then my That's husband right. dies, presumably yes. I already have a share in that property. A share. Can I yes. have a share in my husband's share again? I, I believe so, because you see, the, the, first of all, let's say the constitution says that a spouse, has, a spouse shall not be denied of an interest in the other spouse's property, whether or not the other person left a will. That is the starting point. So automatically, the constitution gives you some sort of interest in, in your spouse's property, particularly as there's also protection afforded for you under section 13 where you can go and say that you know you were not adequately catered for under the will of your, your of your spouse because if he decides not to give his share to you and and your share of the property may not be adequate to sustain you i believe you are still entitled to 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 his portion of of, of the property Okay, Kofu, Kofi Amposa Oche also asked that we learned about marriage and spousal properties last week. Yeah. If I live with my wife, she's equally entitled to everything that I have. If I make a will with my nephew entitled to 20% of my wealth, how valid will this, how valid will this, since my wife technically has half of everything I have? So, so she was going out, um, if, say it's 100%, presumably like 50% is allotted to the woman, and I give majority of it to a third party, can I, can I give like, I, like I indicated, like I indicated, the concept of spousal property is something that um, Parliament was supposed to legislate on to actually regulate the rights of spouses in respect of their properties. So, in the absence of this, the the Act of Parliament, now the courts are left to define what is spousal property because at that point in time you are unable to determine whether you know you have. 80% or 50%. We start as equality, um, equality is equity, but it will be the cause because the wife can go and say that, look, my husband did not really contribute if, I mean, the evidence is quite clear that she did not really contribute to, to, to some extent. And that percentage of the husband is 10%. Then of course the husband cannot go that 20% that he's talking about. You understand? And then the last question is from Stephen Ovin Daku. He asks that in depositing a will, can you deposit it together with a storage device containing recording uh, the proceedings of making the will? That's a surprise. When, 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 you are, when you are depositing your will, can you add a pen drive, which will show that as at the time. 
Well, I don't think that there's anything that inhibits you from doing that. In fact, I must say that in our practice as a firm, these days, that is what we do. Apart from the fact that we deposit a will, we also take a video recording of the process to avoid any form of um, dispute subsequently. Because apart from, you see, the position of the law is that on the face of it, if the will is deemed to have been executed appropriately, then it is valid, unless there's any contrary evidence. So if there appears to be any form of ambiguities or if there appears to be any form of uncertainty on the face of the will that the will was actually not executed by the testator, then of course, the extrinsic evidence of the pen drive, you know, having a video footage of the will would really come in handy in proving that it was actually the deceased person who made the will. I think somebody has raised his hand, Desmond Tutu. Yeah, Desmond Tutu. Uh, okay, before Desmond comes in, um, this is to inform all of you that this program is called The Lawyer's Diary. Uh, we pray that you follow us on our social media pages so you become aware of our upcoming programs. On Instagram, we are The Lawyer's Diary Global. On Facebook is the Lawyer's Diary, and then subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Since every program that we do, we also upload it onto our YouTube page. And this program is sponsored by two companies. One is Jibo Kente. If you need any Kente for your program, kindly follow them on social media, Jibo Kente and Enos Travel. So um, you can unmute yourself, turn on your video, and ask any question that you want the lawyer to answer. That's more. I've seen you raise your hand. Or oh, Edwin. Oh, that's <laughs> Can I make I my think point? I see senior, senior, senior. Yeah, senior. You can, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I just want to say. Um, so much uh, appreciative of what Isaac has done. My brother. He has been very articulate. He, he has explained so much. And even so, for some of us who work as lawyers, we have learned uh, so much, so much uh, from him. And I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much to him. Uh, my other quick contribution is, uh, I think over time we have come to realize that sometimes people feel that they don't have enough to will away. And <laughs> it has been part of the reasons why quite a lot of people have not even done wills at all. And to all such people, most of the time, that's what I tell them that if you have some free time, take a piece of paper and start writing down your assets you will be surprised mm -hmm. that how much you the kind have, of things that we uh, have. To, wow. uh, to give away. You and then, all your law books. <laughs> <laughs> which are quite expensive, actually. Which are quite expensive, you know. Yes. And the second thing is, um, apart from that, there are certain things that are crucial or, or important to you, which as of itself may not attract any market value. But because yeah. it has played a very important uh, thing in your life, it, it becomes valuable. Mm, it's mental value so, uh -huh. so if you give something like that to your child, um, they may value it. For instance, your watch that you may have used for a long time, it may be old and rickety, but the sentimental value of it, giving it to your child, may be one that he cherishes for a while or for a long time. So I think for all of us, the advice that we should take from this is to try and make a will. Because as my brother um, Isaac said, the, the, you don't know. I think we've lost. So when you're going to choose going, uh, uh -huh. you settle your affairs and you don't have issues going forward. It's, very important and critical. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Senior, for your contribution. All right. So, um, Father, Father Joseph Adusi, you can also unmute yourself, and then um, I, I saw your, your hand was raised up. Christiana Cranton. I've seen your hand is raised up, and with and this one, this one, two, two as well. 
Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I would like to ask him, um, I asked the question on the uh, a joint maybe spousal project. So in this case, the widow owns 50% and the, and the widow also owns 50%. Um, on the demise of the of, of either of the partners, can um, let's say that the widow has uh, kids, okay, and the other partner also has kids of his own. Can the widow will have fifty percent share to just her children? Mm, yes, I believe so. If if I mean you have indicated that um, the, the spouse has fifty percent stake in the property, and let's let, let's mm -hmm. begin by saying that spouses can acquire properties going in. When they do such acquisition, they acquire it jointly and they have individual stake. You can make a will of what your entitlement is. And when you actually make a will, you are liberty to give it to whoever you want. So that's about okay. it. So it will be up to the executor to determine the 50%. Exactly. That is what I will say that because, you know, um, the concept of spousal property is something that over the years has been at the message of the court, looking at the surrounding circumstances. It will be, of course, the executors through the courts to make a declaration on the, 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 the entitlement of the spouses, you understand? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think Senior has raised his hands. Um, Senior Edwin, you can, you can come in to uh, put some clarity on this. I, I, I'm sorry, my hands were not raised at all. Ah, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, the person can uh, turn on the video, mute him or herself, and then ask a question. Okay, if there are no further questions, additions, subtractions, or appraisals, I would want to use this opportunity to thank Lawyer Lati for this um, Anna Dallas by coming on this show. We really appreciate your time and then the level of knowledge that you displayed today. We are grateful. And we hope that some other day, some other time, when we extend another gratitude, uh, another um, hand to you, you would spare us one of your busy shadows <laughs> to appear on this show. We are, we are grateful. I've seen one last question from, oh, okay, so it's from Enoch. He says, thank you both. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much, our lawyers. Um, this has been an exciting program. Uh, we are also grateful for your time and attention. As I said, please, log on to our social media pages, follow us, like our pages, and then also be in the know that our program is sponsored by Jibo Kete and Enos Travel. See you same time next week. No, Council, humbly, before you go, there's a question wanting to ask where they can find Lawyer Lati. So if you could uh, state again where he, he is and where he works so that uh, uh, those who want to find him can. Okay, okay, okay. So Lalate works at um, Sam Okujeto and Associates. Uh, we will send you follow-up emails on the, the program that we just did. We will include his contact in the email so that if you may want to contact him, his email address will be provided as well and you can um, uh, link up with him. So, Loya, thank you very much. Thank you very much for thank coming. You so much. Thank you so and much. And we are grateful. See you same time next week. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.